everybody. Very Welcome warm. to church online today. You know, it's the day after Christmas. So I don't know what you say. Happy Boxing Day. Uh, I'm just thankful you're with us, joining with us today as we just worship and we continue to celebrate uh, Christ in this season, a unique time. Maybe you're with family, friends. Uh, uh, you know, you might have some prayer requests today. We would love to connect with you. Please let us know how we can do that. But let's just go into worship at this time today. A love that's never failing Let mercy fall on me And everyone needs forgiveness The kindness of a Savior The hope of nation Oh, and Savior he can move the mountains my god is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave find me oh my fears and failures fill my life again I give my life to follow everything I believe in now I surrender yes I surrender
crushing in the pressing you are making new wine in the soil I now surrender you are breaking new ground so I yield to you and to your careful when I trust you, I don't need to understand. So make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing. And all you have given me, Jesus, bring me out of me in the crushing in the pressing you are making new wine in the soil I now surrender you are breaking new ground. You are breaking new ground. So make me your vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing. Given me, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Oh, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. So where there is new. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see His wounds, His hands, His feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. Body bound and drenched in tears, 
They laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all of
You know, as we worship and as we celebrate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, this season uh, is such an incredible time to be thinking about others. I want to say thank you for connecting and being a part of the global community of needs, uh, not just here at home, but across uh, the globe. Uh, your, your support is making a difference in big ways. And so I uh, just want to remind you uh, to connect with us if this is your first time with us today. Um, and you're watching online, we're so glad you're with us. Um, please let us know how we can reach out to you and help you and serve you in any way. Maybe you have some questions about the church and how you, you can get involved. Uh, just send us an email, connect at myjourney.church. We'd love to give you some more information, connect with you, have a coffee in any way that makes sense to you. Um, I wanna say thanks for your support. Thanks for your financial contributions. Still got some more days left in the month before we close our year-end books and so please consider how you can uh, support families in need uh, bringing your best gift as we close off the year in just a few days time and we ring in the new year uh, with that in mind i want to just just draw your attention to a couple of things that are happening in the new year starting january 2nd to the 15th we have what is called our 14 days of prayer and fasting so make sure you find out more about that Go to our website, go to our prayer section, and you can download a guide. You can pick up some guides here in person at the church, and you can follow along with us some how to just ring in the new year right. You know, there's a couple of times in the year where we have corporate days of prayer and fasting. It happens around August, September, and once again in the new year. There's no other way, better way, to start your year correctly than it is in getting in God's Word. So let me just encourage you to be a part of it. We're doing something a little bit different this year. So tune in to be a part of that. And um, we are looking forward to you participating with us. Also, just get ready. Go, uh, you gotta make sure to go online and find out all the events that are happening because I can't bring them up here today. But there's so much. So go to our website under the events tab. Lots of things happening. I want you to also know this life in the spirit is happening again, uh, 28th, 29th, and 30th. So it's a free event. i uh, love for you to look into that as we just invite the Holy Spirit into our lives and to be a part of everything that we do. And so we're glad to be able to do this again. So without further ado, let's go into the word today. Do you know that God is here? His spirit dwells among us. He is a comforter in the storm and a God when we are lost. He is eternal and unseen. He flows in us like a mighty river. He is everywhere at once, yet he is closer than a friend. He is our helper. He is our guide. He is God. Church, if you are tuning in today, well, congrats to you. Pat yourself on the back because it is the day after Christmas. And let's be honest, if you're tuning into church, this is probably a pretty big deal because most people are laid out on a food coma. And, you know, it's just the day after Christmas. So thank you for tuning in today. And I am very excited that the year is coming to an end. I know most of us, you know, are excited 2021 is almost over. We just have a few more days left. And so today I want to just dive in and, and what it looks like to prepare ourselves for the next year. Um, and I'm sure uh, thinking of just, you know, being in a food coma and your homes, those of you that have opened all your gifts and had people over and it's just you're, either your house is two things. Either is in a state of chaos where wrapping paper is all over or it's a state of cleanliness where you know you are on top of things so you know what I'm gonna be diving right back into that in just a minute uh, in regards to figuratively what it looks like to prepare our homes I know during the Advent season we sang a lot of songs and we indicated the words and we said Emmanuel God with us and I began to really dwell on that and really just seeking the Lord what does it look like for God to be with us 
I know in the Christmas season we sing that, but moving on into the new year, what does that look like? What does it look like for me? What does it look like for our community? What does it look like for our church? Um, just the area even that we're around, like how does God, how is God with us? And that's the question that I've been pondering. And when I think about that, the concept of with us is actually woven like a glitter gold thread throughout the pages of the Bible. It's like it has its sparkles all over it. And we notice that God's intentions is to really dwell, dwell with us. Though the ability for man to live perfectly with God was really lost in the Garden of Eden, as you know, and God has made his presence known throughout history. So meeting with Isaac and Abraham and Jacob, leading his people with fire, a column, a column of smoke, literally residing in the, tent, in the tent tabernacle and in the temple in Jerusalem. These are things where we see that Jesus, that God himself dwelled in a physical manifestation, but eventually he came to dwell with us as one of us, as a person of Jesus. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. John chapter 1 verse 14 says that. And then Jesus would return home in heaven. He sent the Holy Spirit who, then it says here in John 14, 17, abide with you and will be in you. This is what I want to focus on today. Why is it that Jesus, his spirit wants to dwell within us? What does that look like? God himself chose to dwell in us. I think that's very profound. I hope you understand the power of that, that God wants to dwell in you. We don't deserve it. And just like I explained Adam and Eve in sin, how that has really tangibly changed how we encounter God. You see, oftentimes, Scholars say that one of the first times that God's presence appeared to all the Israelites in a tangible way was at the foot of Mount Sinai. So we're going to quickly look at Exodus 19. And it says here, On the morning of the third day, there were thunder, lightning, and a thick cloud on the mountain, and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke, because the Lord has descended on it on its fire. The smoke of it went up like smoke of a kiln, and the mountain greatly trembled greatly. This is Exodus chapter 19, verse 16 to 18. God is powerful. So this makes sense to see his majesty the way it is, this powerful storm that comes like a rushing wind and is accompanied by trumpets and blasts of smokes. And we see in scripture tongues of fire. This can be an intimidating experience of the physical manifestation of God. You see, but the Israelites were expecting something different. And so what they did as a people is that they trembled in fear. And they told Moses that, you know what, they... We, we don't want to speak to God. We, we don't want to go up this mountain. They, they were so afraid. They said, Moses, can you go and speak to the Lord directly? So they appointed him on his behalf. And they said to him, you speak to us. Do not let God speak to us lest we die. See, up until this point, all they have known was that God himself was with them, but they had never seen the physical manifestation. If you're following me, I'm going to about to explain a little bit deeper now. You see, Moses told the people to not be afraid, but even still, they did not go up to the mountain like they're supposed to. Instead, they stood far off. So while Moses spoke with God, and at this point, I mean, think about it. You're an Israelite. You are seeing the physical glory of God on a mountain. I would be curious, and I would say, what is going on over there? I would like to go up this mountain and see. But Moses said, you know what? This is my chance to go. But God revealing himself. But it's a fair question, you know, I can understand how they can be scared and they can be nervous seeing what the glory of God looks like. But you know what? God, this is the same God that delivered them out of the hands of Egypt from plagues, raging water and pillars of fire. We see when we look at the Old Testament and we look at scripture, we must understand the severity and the depth of the power of the majesty of God. When we say that God dwells in us, it is not to say that, you know, this is just only happening in the Old Testament. And I'm about to use other explanations to help you understand the concept today. So I love that the entire people was to become the kingdom of priests, not just a kingdom with priests. God was starting to make a change. So that since the people would not come to God, he would have to come to them. And this is when we begin to see that the structure of what it looks like and even just um, what, what the physical manifestations of where the presence of God is going to dwell at was that was becoming a deciding factor. 
And in Exodus chapter 40, verse 34, it says this, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The presence of God now, we have moved on, and we're seeing that the presence of God now dwells in a resting place among the people in a tangible way. And sure enough, it was accompanied by wind and fire. God is so majestic. And I think we forget that. The theme just doesn't end there, though. Let's look at the same presence in Leviticus chapter 9. We see the ordination of Aaron and his sons as priests, right? The Lord accepted Aaron's offering, and Aaron blessed the people. And as this happens, the glory of the Lord appeared before all the people. And the fire came from before the Lord and consumed the offering, it says. So we see the same thing in Leviticus as we see in Exodus 19 and 40. This is the glory of God dwelling in the physical place. We see a difference between Exodus and, the, and, and even just what's happening. But this is huge because now what we're seeing is God's presence that now is only available to a limited group of people. Well, particularly with Moses, now we see that for the first time it's being expanded, his presence is being made known to other people. This is major. You see, what God is doing is that he is coming to us. He is coming to the people to come and allow his presence to dwell in that. And later on, we see the building of the temple in Jerusalem and how priests had to prepare. I'm so fascinated with the Old Testament and the rituals and the laws that they had. Though we are not bound by the law today, I love and see what I can appreciate, that they took the intentionality and said, we are going to a meeting place to meet God there, so therefore we will prepare ourselves. God's presence dwelt in the tabernacle and eventually the temple. And so I love that this is so important that they understand that in order to go into these places where they would encounter God and encounter his presence to dwell on them, the people had to prepare themselves. Priests could not just simply walk into the tabernacle in jeans and a hoodie and say, thank you, Lord, I'm going to meet you here. They had to cleanse themselves. They had to do ritualistic things. They had to bring burnt offerings. They were, the list are so extensive. You know, something about my culture that I really appreciate is I'm Ethiopian. And one of the things I love about my culture is the culture of hospitality. And I really appreciate that. You see, when a guest comes to our home, what we do is, you know, we don't just do the regular cleaning. We do what you call like spring cleaning. You know, when you throw away everything and you declutter and you wipe everything down, you go kind of go like this with the dust and you inspect it. Like we take really, really good intentionality to prepare our place. I remember growing up though, I used to think, well, who's going to come to my room and open my drawers and inspect my closet or open my doors and say, hey, you did not have a, like, we can't stay in this house because of your closet. And it was customary, you know, whenever we'd have guests over, no matter how significant they were in our lives, whether, whether it was someone special or just the neighbor coming over, we prepared our homes. This is something that I actually, growing up, never appreciated until recently. The act of preparing our homes. How are we preparing for what is to come? How do we prepare for the Spirit of God to dwell in us? If, our, if, if us ourselves, our bodies, figuratively, our home, where we can dwell the presence of God, which the scripture tells us, how are we making room and preparing for that? You see, with the tabernacle and the temple and the tent and all these things where God's presence would dwell in the Old Testament, we see that there had to be a level of preparation and there had to be all of that to take place. But I love this by C.S. Lewis. I read this and I really, really resonated with this. He said the following. He said, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you can understand what he's doing. He get, he's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roofs and so on. You knew that those jobs need doing and you are not surprised. But presently he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abdominally and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he's building quite a different house from the one you thought of, throwing out a new wing here, putting extra floor here and there, running up uh, towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. The presence and the majesty of God wants to dwell in us. He wants to dwell in our presence. He wants to be here in us. He wants to, um, it's, it's an honor even for him to say, I want my presence to be with you. I, I don't think sometimes we understand the severity or the importance of the significance of that. The holy God wants to be here. He wants to do, who am I to receive such glory? 
this is what I want to focus on. And I love that the prophet Joel says this. He speaks on the future when the spirit of the Lord will pour out on all people. He says this in Joel chapter 2 verse 28. He says, it will come about this, that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. This is before it's time. The prophet Joel says there's going to come a time when the spirit of God is no longer going to be in a meeting place, but he's going to dwell in you. This is a huge shift from the Old Testament to the New Testament. I love this. I want us to, to think about how in the Old Testament you had to get, get yourself ready. And guess what? It was not accessible to every single person to encounter God. But when Jesus came, he fulfilled the prophecy so that he can, we can come and to him just as we are. I love that God's dwelling place among his people, but his spirit is what's making it apparent. We are now the temple. We are the dwelling place. What does this mean for us? It goes without saying that it's possible because of Jesus, just like I said. But in John chapter 14, 16, 17, he says that there will be a spirit sent to them. He promised that they will be baptized by the Holy Spirit. The presence of God inhabiting his people means that we are now part of the new temple. So, Why is it important that we understand the significance of the dwelling place of encountering the presence of God in a physical manifestation to now understanding that the Spirit of God wants to desire to dwell in us? This is where the Holy Spirit comes in. And I think we need the Holy Spirit in order for us to make room for what he's trying to do in the next year. What God is trying to do before December 31st. What God is trying to do in our lives before we even get out the door tomorrow. There is an opportunity that we have that we're not seizing on a daily basis. How are we preparing ourselves? How are we preparing our home? And I love that John chapter 14 verse 25 to 27 says the following. And I'm reading the Amplified Version. It says... I have told you these things while I am still with you. But the helper, the helper, comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, in my place, to represent me and my act on my behalf, will teach you all these things. He will help you remember the things that I have told you. Peace I leave with you. My perfect peace I give to you, not as the world do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled. Do not be afraid. Let my perfect peace calm you in every circumstance and give you courage and strength in every challenge. The Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Counselor wants to dwell in you. We are not a tabernacle that is so clean and, and so pristine that has been kept and taken care of. What are the things in our lives that we're hiding away from people where we don't want people to see that? If our insides were a home, Think of all the different rooms that if a guest were to come in to invade that space, how welcomed would they feel? If I'm being honest, there's definitely some areas that are like, this is like hands off. I will only let people come into my life, you know, for me to, to open up those doors or show them that room if it's very, very, if I feel safe. Even sometimes, you know, when you have people come over unexpectedly and someone come, well, this is before COVID, obviously, because now people have to make sure that you're good and all that. But there was a time when, you know, people would just come over. Right? They'd just say, hey, I'm just popping by. I'm just stopping by to see you. How's it going? And you'd have to frantically get your house ready. You know? Or you are so comfortable with the way that things are, whether it's a disaster, whether you're a hoarder, or maybe there's just you have tendencies that are not necessarily, you know, they're unpopular opinions, and you're comfortable with that. You see, in my culture, when we say that someone's coming, what we say is we want to receive them. It is an act of honor. It is an act of respect. It is an honor to, to have someone in our space, in our home, and we want to give our best foot forward. It is not performative. I would say that it's something that I have to learn, that the hospitality is, is taking care of those things. You see, sometimes when we say, Holy Spirit, come, we are not thinking of making room and get rid getting rid of things that we know we need to get rid of. When the Spirit of God wants to dwell in you, this is something He chose to rest upon you. And even the scripture tells us the comfort of the counselor. This majestic God wants to dwell in us. But sometimes we have pride. And pride really hinders us from seeing the Spirit of God move in our lives. This pride, what it does is it says, this is hands off. There are some rooms that are allowed. Lord, yes, you can go, Spirit of God, you can go into those rooms, you can go into those spaces, but we have things that are off limit where we say, no one can touch that. That is the basement, no one goes down there. This is a compartmentalized area that I don't want anyone to touch. But what the Holy Spirit is trying to do is he wants to come and dwell in you. 
not some of you. It is all of you. There is rooms in your life, in your heart, that God wants to make room for that. There is this presence that he wants to dwell in you, not because it is just for, just because he wants to do that for fun, but it is a holy thing. It is a holy thing. It is a tabernacle, the temple that we talked about, but now we are that. Scripture tells us over and over again in the New Testament that our bodies are meant to be holy, that are meant to be um, a dwelling place for the Spirit of God. I remember literally having this radical encounter of encountering the Spirit of God. I remember being at a camp and actually I was, I was a youth leader there and I was taking a group of students with me there for the first time and I kind of was not coming to encounter anything. I kind of sat in the back and my hands were crossed and I said, you know what, that's great for them, but I, I'm just here to kind of observe. I really don't know if I, I just was in a place where I had gone through something traumatic and I was really struggling. And I remember sitting in the back of the room and thinking, you know what, the preacher is talking about you know, the Spirit of God, and he's talking about how we need this and we need that. And I'm thinking, this is not like, how does this affect me? Like, I just, you know, took some time off work so I can be here, I can serve the church, and I can just get back to work and move on with my life. Let's wrap it up, sir. <laughs> that was the mentality I had. And then I remember he said, you know what? If there's anything that you want to give to the Lord, and he just did this altar call, I found myself to the front, just, and I fell to the ground, and I was weeping. I didn't realize there were things in my life that I had so shut off from God that I didn't even invite him into those things in my heart that needed God. I need the touch of God to truly be released and freed from those things. I struggle with a lot of anger, with a lot of bitterness, with a lot of resentment. But I, what I had done was I closed off those doors and I said, God, you can go everywhere else but that. I don't want to unpack that. And I remember the day after that, Waking up and, in, and seeing myself for the first time, it's almost like my eyes were completely wide open. It was a physical manifestation that God had transformed me. And I said, all I wanted to do after that was, God, I wanted more of you. I wanted more of your presence. I wanted more of your wisdom. I, want, I just want more of you, Lord. And I wanted to walk out in that. You see, sometimes when we clean a house before we travel, for example, you know, we, I like to clean before I, I, leave, I, I travel somewhere. I want to make clean because I want to come back to a clean home. You see, sometimes we have habits that are unclean. There are habits that are causing us to, to not really even make room for the Holy Spirit. But God doesn't want to condemn us. What he wants to do is he wants us to trans be transformed because this is available to us freely. One of the major differences between the Spirit in the Old Testament and the New Testament is very apparent, like I just explained. In the New Testament, it teaches the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit on us, the believers. But we place our faith in Christ for salvation. The Holy Spirit comes to live within us. It dwells in us. Like Apostle Paul says in Ephesians, he says, guarantee of our inheritance. In contrast, in the Old Testament, it was selective and temporary. The fact that God, his presence wants to dwell in you. Let that be something that empowers you to walk every day. Say, the mighty God who built these majestic mountains, who created this beautiful earth, where we live, where we dwell. God, and you choose to dwell in me. This is a profound thing. It empowers us to walk freely moving forward in our lives, especially as we encounter a new year and we go into the next step. Through him, we come to know God's love. The Holy Spirit helps us to love God. And I think that the Holy Spirit, what he has done during that season of my life was to teach me deeper and deeper the need for him, that I'm a sinner, that I have pride, that I have this, I have, I have all these things that, man, it is a process of sanctification where I'm getting rid of this and saying, God, I'm taking out the trash. I'm taking out the things that need to be removed because if I don't call it out and if your spirit of God does not call it out, I sometimes live in this place of comfort. You see, some of us are living in houses internally that is filled with turmoil and anger and, and, and just so much havoc. It is a disaster. But God is saying, I still want to dwell in you. Will you invite me in? Will you make room for me? This is the power of the gospel. And I love that fellowship or communion in the Greek language of the New Testament involves a few things. And I think this is kind of what I want to highlight on when it comes to how do we create an indwelling for the Spirit of God. The first thing is fellowship, right? And we know that fellowship means companionship. God desires with us in friendship. He wants to desire with us to be constant, that we have an ongoing relationship. Like think of the friends that you have. You look forward to speaking with them and being with them. 
And the fact that God's Spirit dwells within us allows us to fellowship with Him in a new way. The second thing is partnership. Really, we, we actually get an opportunity to partner with His Spirit. He partners with us in life. And in counseling the work that he's called us to do, God desires to guide, counsel, empower us in all that we do. Our responsibility is to seek and do what God pleases in all that we do. There was a period of my life where I was like, Lord, I need to pray about everything. And it got to a point where everyone's like, okay, do you need to pray about even like brushing your teeth? You're getting a little heck crazy. That never happened. I'm just kidding. But I remember being like, I just wanted this partnership with God. Because I knew that if I partnered with God, if I partnered with His Spirit, if I really leaned into what was already available to me, I can walk in the authority that He's given me. And lastly is intimacy, right? This involves our thoughts, our secrets, and desires that each person shares with the other. God wants us to have intimacy with Him because He desires to know our thoughts, to know our secrets, to know the things that the world doesn't know, the areas that, that we're hiding away. This is where we begin. We begin with fellowship, with partnership, and with intimacy. Now, how, how do we walk this out? I know I'm talking about being a, a place where God wants to dwell and His Spirit wants to rest on us, but three things I wanna share with you. How do we become a dwelling place? And this is something I'm still learning. But the first thing is repent. I remember there was a period where the Holy Spirit in my life, well, he still does, but I felt a strong conviction about some mistakes that I had made and I had hurt some people. And the Lord revealed to me, that, uh, that is my son, that is my daughter. You have made a grave mistake here. I remember hearing that so clearly and saying, whoa, I, I you know, I didn't, I just heard that so clearly. I remember calling the person, and I've, I haven't talked to them in a couple years, and I called them and I said, hey, I said, what do, you, what, what do you want? Like, what's going on? And I was like, hey, I apologize for the way that I treated you. I apologize for the way that I responded. And I remember as I was saying these words, I began to tear up. And the person was like, okay, thanks. And then they hang up. After they hung up, I was like, okay, God, this is not how I expected to go. I thought they were going to give me some praises. Like, wow, you called me. You apologized. Wow, that's amazing. And I'm thinking, like, I'm going to get some praise. And he said to me, repentance sometimes looks like confessing right? Repentance is not just saying like, oh, I'm so guilty, but it's actually taking ownership. You see, to live a life, we, we need to live a lifestyle of repentance. We need to live a lifestyle where we say, God, I have grieved the Holy Spirit. I have grieved you. I have repented. I have sinned against you in my thoughts. I have sinned against you in the ways that I lived, in the way that I have offense, in the way that I have anger, in the way that I have bitterness. I want more of you, Jesus. I want more of your spirit in me. And Let's be honest, we are sinners and we are unclean and, and no, no matter how we approach it. But even though we are not priests, we need to continue to live a life where we say, God, if I have grieved you, I, I need your repentance. So I repent for the things and I'm going to take ownership of the things I did because I want my life to glorify you and you alone. If I live my life to glorify myself, then I don't need to repent because I'm not sorry. I want to turn away from the things that I did do and I want to turn towards you. That's what repentance is. So I feel like that is the beginning of us becoming a dwelling place of the Spirit of God. The second thing is to invite Him. Man, like I said, the invitation is important. Like in our culture, with the deep cleaning, this sometimes was like to the point where I remember thinking, okay, like we have been cleaning for so many days. When is it going to end? <laughs> but I realized something. It's an invitation to receive. It is a posture to receive what is to come. It is a posture to say, I am open to receive what is to come. And as a kid, I couldn't understand what the big fuss was. Why can't people just come to our dirty house? Why can't they just come and see how my house is? What, like, I, I didn't understand, but now I see that it's, like, it's an act of saying, you know what, in order for me to invite, I need to prepare as well. So in our invitation, we need to prepare. Inviting him into the corners where are, where are the things that you have shut off that you don't want anyone to deal with. Invite him into that frustration, into that shame, into that anger, that bitterness, even the unforgiveness, into your church hurt, into the things that you are struggling with. This is what it looks like to invite God. But it's also to prepare ourselves saying, okay, knowing I'm going to invite him means that there's going to be work to be done and I'm ready to do the work. And lastly, I want to say is to walk in authority, to walk in confidence. You see, the Holy Spirit produces the, the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is something that doesn't just happen overnight. You can't just go, okay, Holy Spirit, I invite you, and I, and I repent, and boom, 
I'm walking in confidence. No, walking in his authority is to say that I want to live a life led by the Spirit because the Spirit of God, the hope of God that is in me, this majestic God that wants to dwell in me, he chooses to dwell in me. He doesn't have to, but he wants to. And now I get to go out and do something with that that is available to me. Let us not waste our time thinking about the things that don't produce the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We need to produce more. We need to become more patient. I know for myself, amen, every time I ask for more patience, it seems like the Lord keeps like testing me. So, you know, y'all need to pray for me. But I'm just saying like the Holy Spirit loves us even through the, our difficulties. But it's to say, God, I'm going to choose to walk in love. I'm going to choose to walk in gentleness. I'm, I'm making a conscious decision to be in partnership with you, to be in fellowship with you, so I can really truly walk out in that. Whatever the circumstances, you know, we know that we can have peace in our hearts because we know where we have been, but we don't know where we're going. So the biggest difference is knowing that, you know what, Spirit of God, I'm here, I'm willing, I'm able, and I want to be in your presence. I love that Tokens of Wisdom um, by Marianne Will Williamson, and she said this, and I really thought about this in a really, really unique way. She said, the Holy Spirit guides us to a different perception of reality, one that is based on love. His correction of our perception is called atonement. The only thing lacking in any situation is our own awareness of love. And asking the Holy Spirit to help us, we are expressing our willingness to perceive a situation differently. We give up our own interpretations of opinions and ask that they be replaced by his. When in pain, we pray, dear God, I'm willing to see this differently. In surrendering our situation to God means surrendering to him our thoughts about it. What we, what we give to God, he gives us back renewed through the vision of the Holy Spirit. So church, I want to encourage you as we prepare for 2022, and maybe you have not made any resolutions this coming year, or maybe you're, you're kind of a little bit hesitant because the virus and, and the variant and all these things, and there's just so much going on in your life. Can I encourage you to think about how you can clean your internal home? How you can prepare yourself to continue to allow the Spirit of God to take up more room in your heart, in your home, in your physical body. He wants to dwell in you. The majestic and powerful God, part of the Trinity wants to dwell in you forever. He's not an it, he's a person who dwells in us and he helps us love Jesus more. And he wants us to walk in a life of freedom. To walk, in, to walk in the spirit means that we yield to his control. We follow his lead and we allow him to exert his influence over us. To walk in the Spirit is the opposite of resisting Him or grieving Him. So my prayer for you, church, is that you would think of ways that you can prepare and make the next year, the year where you can develop fellowship and intimacy and even just a companionship with God. And continue to remember that we need the Spirit of God. When pride rises up, when anger rises up, what are the things that God help me to see clearly? Help me to see things through your lens because I need you. I know for sure there's been moments in this year where my pride has come up and I've had to face it. And I'd say, Holy Spirit, I'm going to need you to help me. I know you are here with me. You dwell in me. So let me honor that. Let me preserve that. And let me walk in the authority that you've given me. So let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Take every room over every room that I have shut off from you. I give you permission to help me clean the house, to be purified so I may glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. I pray that this has been an encouragement for you. And we as pastors want to encourage you to just dive in. Maybe if some of the scriptures you didn't understand, feel free to go back. We have some notes in the tab for you as well. And also, we just want to say that we will be having um, our life in the spirit again at the end of January coming up in 2022 so take the next couple of weeks to really just um, think about the ways that God can continue to grow you in love and patience and kindness and joy so as we're encouraged by the word of the Lord today I just want to let you know that if there's anything we can do to serve you to uh, pray for you the we're always available to you please just reach out to us connect at myjourney.church or go to our website under the prayer tab and and find a way to for you to to connect with us in prayer we would love to do that if there's anything more we can do please let us know make sure you you go to our website go to myjourney.church events 
and find out all there is that's coming up in the days ahead. Look forward to seeing you really soon. God bless. I guess we'll see you in the new year.